people have nothing to look at but our mugs. They start to critique everything. So just because of that and for no other reason, you have one little hair that Emma might be able to help you with that people are going to stare at the whole time. We do this all the time. There's one hair, look, and somebody's gone over fixing it. So, Christine, you have nothing but my gratitude. <laughs> Welcome to Find Your Way Home on Radio Maria and on YouTube. I am very excited to have a very special guest, and he has just fixed his hair for us so that things couldn't be better. <laughs> and I needed help with that as well, Christine. But it's it's done. It's perfect. Now, oh, I better not touch Yes, it takes a village. <laughs> it takes a village. And Father Dara is going, is coming to us from Ireland. Am I right? Am I wrong? That's right. Here in Ireland at the headquarters of the Apostolate of the Returning King, we would call it. Uh, the Soul Sanctuary, we have called our headquarters here, or in Irish for some of your viewers who I know are watching and listening in and from Ireland. So it would be Termin Anima is the Irish for Soul Sanctuary. So that's, yeah, that's our place here. Oh, nice. And and feel free to throw in the uh, Irish bro. So, so we in America love it, and we try to copy it. We don't do a good job. Well, I have nothing except the Irish accent in abundance, so you guys are in for one big treat. And and my listeners and viewers are in for a treat. I am 164th Irish, and, and I hold that very proudly. I, I'm sure you do. It is a, a beautiful thing to behold. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us how you got involved with the Apostolate of the Returning King. Well, I was ordained in 2002, and I was sent immediately, and I was only 24, I was 24 when I was ordained, and turned 25 the following month, and my first assignment as a priest was as chaplain to a community school in a town called Baileyborough in the county of Cavan in the Diocese of Kilmore in Ireland. So that was my first assignment, and I was there for four years. And during those four years, I got to know a woman who came into the school to give talks on domestic violence prevention. Mm. And this was Anne. Mm. And so I, over those years, came to know Anne in this work. It's mm. what she was uh, doing, some very beautiful and impactful work in the area of domestic violence prevention, giving talks in schools and talking to women's groups, working with law enforcement and policy development, all that area of life. But during those days, Anne was also having the experience of uh, receiving locutions from Jesus, from God the Father, from the Blessed Mother. And she began sharing these with me. And I was quite edified by what I read and quite impacted by them. If you read the volumes, the early volumes, volume one and two, you'll see that that was recorded around 2002, 2003. So it was, and four and onwards, it was in those days. So this was the apostolate in its infancy and beginning, the beginning of a worldwide movement and a new movement within the church. And uh, after four years of, uh, school chaplaincy, the bishop assigned me as full-time chaplain to the apostolate mm. because it was a very, very clear that it was a new movement, that Anne needed all the support and encouragement that uh, the church could offer. And so he made the decision, of course, uh, it's what I wanted uh, to, uh, to assign me as chaplain to the apostolate. So that was in 2006, and I've been chaplain with the apostolate in a full-time capacity since then. So I'm there right since the very beginning of the, the Apostolate, really. So to show the viewers and to have the listeners hear about it, this is one of the volumes. There are many, many books, many, many volumes. And if you are interested in learning more, you would go to www.directionforourtimes.com. And I'll put a link at the bottom of this video uh, so you can go there to that website. And I'll also put links to where you can hear Father Dara sing. 
unless he prohibits that and oh we don't cut people off we don't want to put people off. no it'll bring them closer to god <laughs> or at least have them praying to god for some reason <laughs> Well, exactly, for one reason or another. But, you know, it's interesting you use the, you know, our website is directionforourtimes.com or .org. Uh, either, either works. And people will sometimes ask, what's the difference between Direction for Our Times and the Apostolate of the Returning King? Uh, it's just when you mention it, it, it occurs to me to say it that Direction for Our Times is, let's say, the subtitle of the volumes. You'll see Direction for Our Times written on it because... That's indeed what they are, their direction for the times in which we live. And so the organization in civil terms was established, and that's what we called it, because the apostolate of the returning king hadn't come into existence, let's say, at that point. It was mm. after the volumes were received that the Lord continues, as you would expect him to do, to unveil and unfold the plan. He, of course, doesn't tell us everything that he has in mind immediately at the start, and so we had direction for our times, which is the civil entity, you know, we're a 501c3 in the US and a non-profit in Ireland. And yet now we have the apostolate of the returning king, which has developed and grown and been given canonical status uh, within the church. So it's just uh, it's sometimes people get mixed up between the two. So I think it's just interesting to uh, and important to mention that. So you mentioned the title direction for our times and how indeed this is what the Lord is doing in this apostolate. And so we need direction, do we not? Our times have gone cattywampus and I know that Ireland is suffering. Well, yes, the, the situation you refer to, Christine, is the fact that currently in Ireland, it is now a criminal offense for a priest to organize a public mass or for a member of the faithful to attend it. It's, it's something we, we couldn't have possibly envisaged and yet we've been through it in the past here in Ireland. Mm. Uh, we had penal times in, in our history. We, we know about the, these things. We've, we've been there, done that. But mm. here we find ourselves in a similar situation. And for the longest time, people around the world in this past year of pandemic have found themselves to varying degrees and for varying lengths of time deprived of being able to go to communion, to be able to go to mass. And within the, that context, the I want to read one of the messages from volume seven. And in volume seven, it has messages, uh, locutions from various saints. And one of the saints who contributes to this is St. Thomas Aquinas. So remember that this was back in 2004 mm. that Anne recorded the following from him. And it's not something that we could have anticipated. Back in 2004, I maybe I would have read it because I was, you know, as Anne was receiving the, the, the locutions, she would pass them on to me. And I suppose I'd have read this and thought, I don't know what I thought at the time, but it would be understandable to think, oh, surely not, right? <laughs> but let's wait till you hear it. Mm. So he said, my brothers and sisters, you understand that we come to advise you, but also to prepare you, and indeed to advise you on how to prepare. There will come a time when you may be deprived of the sacrament of the Eucharist altogether. This will occur in some areas of the world. It will be a grave and heavy cross. But I assure you that heaven will compensate. You will make spiritual communions and remain united to Christ. You will have angels and saints all around you, willing to console and direct you. So there we were, 2004, and St. Thomas Aquinas, in the midst of Volume 7, tells us we're going to be deprived of being able to participate in the very heart of our liturgical worship and the source and the summit of all that is important to us in the church. And here we in Ireland find ourselves unable to attend Mass. Now, please God, in, in, in May, there's word of that being lessened and us being able to uh, have public Mass again. Funerals and weddings have been allowed to take place in very limited circumstances, limited numbers. But there we were in 2004 being prepared. And that's just one message out of the midst of volume seven 
from the midst of five and eight in particular, where we are being prepared. Mm -hmm. And the overall tenor of the writings is one of a very calm preparing. Just be ready. It's just so that when these things happen, you will know that I am with you. Because you, this is the Lord, of course, that the Lord is communicating to us and all of heaven that when these things happen, rest assured, you will know, ah, yes, we were told this would happen. It's okay. And, and so loving and so generous that heaven will compensate and we'll make, and we're making spiritual communions. I, of course, as a priest, am blessed to be able to say mass and to receive the sacrament. Um, and we indeed are streaming Mass live from our headquarters here every day and have adoration and inviting people to make those spiritual communions as well that St. Thomas spoke about. So that was one of the messages, Christine, and one of the things that we were told would happen and here is happening. So having read all the books a long time ago and, and having been enamored of them, and having found them so rich, is there a particular message that spoke to your heart personally? Those messages would be many. I can tell you that that we, we'd be here, we'd be here for hours. But there's one which always touches me deeply, and one which others report as well as causing them to just a little sharp intake of breath because of its profundity. And I'll share with you because it's from volume two and volume two is conversations with the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. And on the 28th of April, 2003, um, he talks about what it means to be with you, right? He is eager. If there's one phrase that he repeats over and over throughout the, the, the writings is this one that I am with you. And he, he's at pains, let me say, to communicate to us what that means. And so in volume two, we will find that uh, expressed in so many ways. So I'm going to share this one with you. And I had it marked. Let me see. Okay. My children, I am with you. You have heard me say that many times before. Perhaps I have said it so often that you do not really hear it. Today I want you to both hear these words and understand them. I am with you. Does that mean I watch you from heaven, hoping all goes well with you? Does it mean I gaze out over my whole world, seeing only the large events? No, I am with you. I am with you, my child. That means I see the world from your eyes. I walk your walks. I experience what you experience. I am there when you are hurt. I feel the sting of human unkindness when you experience it. I feel the weakness and pain in your body when you are sick. My compassionate gaze, so filled with love and understanding, rests upon you every minute of every day. I mean, it just gives me goosebumps at the moment, even as I read it, and I've read it a million times. And to get this insight into the level of intensity that is the, invita that is the relationship he is inviting us to engage with. He is so eager that we know him and that where every pain in my body, he feels it. The sting of human unkindness he experiences it, the joys, he rejoices with them. I mean, it's, it's breathtaking, really, in its, in its beauty. And, and that's one of my, my favorite from volume two. Um, there are so many more in here. I mean, again, I could go on all, all evening about it. But let me, if you'll indulge me to share yet another one, Christine, Please. because Anne's experiences mystical experiences have also included 
experiences of heaven and purgatory. And these have been interior visions. You, you asked me earlier, actually, about the manner in which Anne receives these. And she talks about that, actually, in the beginning of volume eight, what it is and how it is she, she experiences these mystical experiences. And one of them are interior visions. So it's with her eyes closed. It's not, a, it's not an external vision. But Christ, and she is with Christ in these experiences, he is, she's keenly aware of him in these experiences. He invites her questions, her engagement with what she sees, which is an onerous task, really, to give somebody, because Anne would describe that she's been shown a leaf, and now she's asked to give some insight into the forest, mm -hmm. and all she has glimpsed is, is one leaf. But there's one piece in uh, The Mist of Mercy, um, where she describes what she experienced in purgatory. Now, the, the description she gives of the souls in purgatory is really quite a, an intense one, I think one would say, because we get a glimpse into the burning remorse that souls in purgatory experience when they contemplate the actions that they took in this life, which did harm to others themselves and to God, and that can be a significant experience, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a painful one. So they say that the souls in purgatory experience both the joy of the knowledge that God is, but also, paradoxically, at the same time, the great grief of the sins that they have committed. So in one um, piece in this, Anne describes that she is being shown in the furthest reaches of purgatory, um, she... Jesus brings her there, and it's in very far reaches where somebody's in the midst of privacy, in the mist, dealing with their stuff and dealing with their, their uh, suffering. And it's a cheerless, dark place, she said. People are wrapped into themselves. They're studying their actions, the impact of their actions and how that affected people. Not a pretty thing, she says. It's not an easy experience. And yet it is mercy, we must remember that this is a, a gift of the utmost mercy by God. And she says to the Lord, Lord, what can I do for them? How can I help them? And Jesus said, look. And Anne said, I saw Our Lady walking through the darkness, putting her little hand on each soul. I heard her whispering, shh, God loves you. Be at peace. You are loved. The whimpering soul quieted after she touched him. How our poor little mother loves us. We must all help her as much as possible because it is this suffering she seeks to prevent. Now, every time I read that, no more than the last one I read, Christine, it just fills me with something. <laughs> I don't know what the words are, but... It's so beautiful that this is what we can do for the souls in purgatory. We have the gift of being able to pray for them mm -hmm. so that the Blessed Mother might just go there, place mm -hmm. her hand on this soul, reassure the soul that God loves them, and then see the whimpering stop and the consoling happen. That's what the prayers, our prayers gain for the souls in purgatory, so we should never refrain from doing that. Now, that's just a little glimpse, Christine, of of one little element of what Anne experienced in purgatory. The Lord also showed her heaven and was very... Uh, let me, okay, you're, you're, I, I can't stop, Christine. You've started the ball rolling. <laughs> so, I, I mean, she, she talks about heaven. I've got climbing the mountain here. And um, she talks about heaven here and, and what uh, uh, Jesus says to her. He said, It is not an easy thing to experience heaven while you remain on earth. At the same time, you can see that many of the things in heaven are similar to the things on earth, inasmuch as these are created by me to give joy to my children. And, you know, so that is a reassurance that God is so eager for us to have, that heaven is not something we should be afraid of. Purgatory, indeed, is not something we should be afraid of. We're always aiming for heaven, of course. We're looking to do our purgatory here on this side of the divide, but that we should not be afraid. There is nothing to fear in death. 
And that reassurance is what heaven is inviting us with to a, a very much different way of life and a way which keeps our minds focused on all the good that is in this earth and in this world. And before we take a short break, I do want to recommend that you read the books that directionforourtimes.com offers. It's given a, a green light to, to go ahead. It's still private revelation. The rosary is private revelation. The sacred heart of Jesus is private revelation. Um, Divine mercy yes. is private revelation. Uh, so people tend to relegate it to, uh, to sidestep it, saying, well, that's, that's not important. And yet, as we can all attest to, the rosary is incredibly important. So on that note, I would really encourage the listeners and the viewers to read these books if you feel so called, because you can catch glimpses of what purgatory is like of what heaven is like. And that helps us live on earth, I believe. We can avoid things in purgatory by by noticing what's happening to people there and why they're there. And we can long for heaven more than we may now because we can find out what awaits us. And I had a friend who told me I'm not interested because these these angels and their harps are boring. It's just boring. (laughs) I I said, well, I don't think you have a glimpse of what heaven really, truly is. Where is a book that, before we take a break, you can recommend Climbing the Mountain? It's Climbing the Mountain, and there's also um, a small book. You can get a couple of these together in a bundle as well. We, we provide it, and maybe I'll give you the link that you can include, Christine. You know, Climbing the Mountain gives you a really good introduction to the history of this apostolate, where it came from, and all of the, much more detail than I have given. There's also a book in in that little bundle called Purgatory, Prayer and Forgiveness. Uh, so the purgatory visions that Anne had are included there, along with uh, a writing on contemplative prayer, forgiveness. There's a booklet called Heaven Speaks to Those Considering Suicide. Uh, it's interesting to see what heaven knows we need these days. Mm. And to those who do not know Jesus, there's a little bundle there mm. that you know give you a list. And of course, volume two is included in that as well. This is the entry point for many people into the apostolate. They read this, they, they know Jesus Christ in a profound way through it. And, and are so blessed. So it's a little bundle. We, we can, it can give you the link for that. What is the bundle called? The bundle is called, uh, I, I think it's the mystical treasures we've called it. So we've just put that little, little group together because, you know, sometimes people come into the, uh, into the office here and they'll come for a visit and I'll be looking and thinking, what will I give somebody just to say, here, take this and and have a read and just as an introduction to the apostle of and and those are some of the things i would just pull off the shelf and and send them away with so i'd encourage uh, the listeners and and viewers to perhaps consider those we encourage you to go to the website and this is find your way home with christine and father Derek connolly of the apostolate of the returning king in ireland and we will be right back So welcome back to Find Your Way Home. This is Father Derek Connolly in Ireland. It's wonderful. I feel like we could do five shows. I don't know about you. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. We may continue on another day, Christine. That would be wonderful. Uh, You don't know what you just agreed to, but thank you. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So Anne Alea Apostle, that's not her real name, and... There have been some questions as to why she's not using her name, and even some criticism of, well, mystics don't do that. How would you respond to that? Well, you know, it's interesting with regard to names and choosing names, uh, you know, Saul and Paul and uh, Carol Vachila was, you know, John Paul II, there's certainly precedence and uh, um, Simon Peter precedence for using and changing names, but with regard to Anne's name, well, in fact, Anne is indeed her real name insofar as it's her middle name. And uh, at the very beginning of the apostolate, Our Lady actually gave the instruction that Anne was to work uh, when she was working in the church. She would be Anne, and in the rest of her life, etc., would be her given name. And the reason for that really was the importance of privacy for a young family and to protect that family life. 
because you can imagine the kind of attention that Anne's experiences would bring on from people. Yeah. And so we understood that that instruction from Our Lady was very important for that reason. And so we endeavored as, and I say we, I mean myself, Anne's parish priest, etc., were very keenly aware of protecting that privacy for a young family. And so it was that uh, following that instruction as well from Our Lady that her privacy would be protected. But now as the years have gone on and the family's grown up and uh, ongoing discernment and decisions are made around that and it's not the same issue that it was and Anne's name is Catherine Ann Clark, yes. Okay. I know that so many people around the world, how many different languages have these books been translated into? There, oh, I think it's about 18 languages we've had them translated into. And these, that's really by people who, for the most part, were blessed by reading the writings in usually English. And then they decide we have to have this in our language. So it was and organic. So they, it just happened. Yeah, but for the most part, it's organic, and we they would contact us and say, hey, listen, I would like to translate into whatever language, and we would work with them uh, in, in assisting that process, yeah. And so I know, like any ministry that is, is so huge, this is worldwide, that you fundraise and such, just so that people know if they donate or, or if they've donated in the past, where does that money go? Um I'm sure it doesn't go into any mansions on, on your or Anne's part. Oh, there have to be easier ways than, <laughs> of making money than, than working in religious circles. There have to be. No, we, we are a registered 501c3 charity in the United States, as I mentioned. Uh, so we're you know, fully accountable for all of our finances as an organization to uh, revenue. And the same in Ireland, we're a registered charity, so we have to make our submissions to the charity regulator and are all, you know, all that's accountable for. And of course, also governed by a board of directors and accountable to the relevant authorities, uh, both civilly and church-wise. So we've got lots of supervision and lots of oversight and lots of uh, instruction and you know all of that start, sort of thing is taken care of and it's important that it should be taken care of and that people know that it is in order and uh, you know that's the way we have always operated right from the very beginning I mean Anne would say look you all just take care of all of that and take care of uh, all of that side of things which we you know the relevant people in charge do all of that take care of the money and the regulatory uh, requirements so back back to the mystical we are headed for a dark time a biblical time and the faithful as you said are being prepared for it by the lord there's an interesting quote in here where if i just tell you rightly where it's coming from. It was actually Cardinal Ratzinger who was quoting Cardinal Sudano at the time. And he said, prediction of the future is of secondary importance. What is of primary importance is the declaration of God's will for the present time. And so the emphasis in both even scripture where there's prophecy <clears throat> and within these and within private revelation isn't so much the times and dates, but it's the implication of it all for us and the invitation that is contained within it to change, to put the focus firmly on personal holiness, to be prepared spiritually. Because, well, quite frankly, a prophecy that has, is going to take place next week is of little importance to me if tomorrow I die. And so it's important that today I'm prepared, I'm ready, I have worked as best I can on my personal holiness, my stuff, the stuff that the souls in purgatory are saying, if only I'd done it there, if only I'd done it in life. And that's the overall thrust of the messages. That's the overall thrust and the direction of all of the revelations, including the prophecies um, that it is that we are focused, we're directed. We have our attention on the things that are important. So I suppose, yes, so with regard to times, dates, imminent things, I wouldn't tend to speculate a whole pile, but it's enough for us to know that we ought to be prepared and preparing. 
And to that end, are there uh, some conversion stories, people that you've seen, some, something that's, a, that's an interesting true tale to tell in terms of people who have been affected by the volumes? That's one question I have. Start the conversion story, I suppose I could start with is my own, uh, insofar as we're all invited to be on an ongoing journey of conversion. And, and I'm not being facetious when I say that, because everybody involved in the apostolate and everybody who experiences the writings describes conversion. I'm changed. I am made different. But we do most certainly hear from people who will report to us what happens in their lives in an even more momentous type of a way. For example, we heard from a man, he just called the office one day and he said, <clears throat> I picked up a booklet, he said, in the back of a church and it was called Heaven Speaks to Those Considering Suicide. Wow. And I read it. And I just want to tell you, he, he didn't say a lot, he says, I just want to tell you there's no way I could ever consider that again. And he was very short in what he said. He didn't give a lot of information, but there's enough in that to know what he experienced. We hear an awful lot from prisoners. We have quite an outreach to prisons and to prisoners. We have a booklet, Heaven Speaks to uh, Prisoners. And we hear from prisoners. We get letters from them regularly. And they tell us of the grace that they receive in the, the prisoner booklet, as we have come to call it. We hear of um, the conversions that they've experienced, and some write to us then when they come out of prison as well. Um, you know, that's another one. There was a one, uh, there's a, a booklet on sexual abuse, and it particularly has helped a lot of people who have been victims of clerical abuse. Mm. And we know, I know of one man who had been a victim of clerical abuse, and the healing that he received through that booklet again mm -hmm. huge we know one family who'll say oh all of us were converted through volume two mm -hmm. and uh, they'll say oh that's the one that got all of us mm -hmm. you know? we, we heard once from a dutch uh, a dutch lutheran minister or rather a former dutch lutheran minister who actually converted to catholicism mm -hmm. having read the volumes and all his family eventually followed him as well mm -hmm. so these are the kinds of things we hear the the fruits and that is and i make sure to to place that within the conversion that is the experience of each apostle of the returning king, each person who has read a booklet or a book, who has been changed, and who has been... And the general theme is, the general direction of that is, is an increase in holiness and an ongoing increase in holiness. That it's not a flash-in-the-pan type of an experience, but rather it's a continuing and, and constant experience. That, that That's something we hear quite a lot from people. And Father, I also was wondering, what is Anne like and how does she handle all the kids, all the ministry work? Well, Anne's priority has always been, and the Lord's priority for Anne has always been family. Her primary vocation is a wife and mother. So that always comes first and always came first. And we in the organization and we in the local parish with myself and Anne's parish priest in the early years when there was a young family, always worked the best we could to support Anne in what she was doing so that her priority could be with the family. But Anne is the type of person who is ordinary like the rest of us, just quite ordinary and yet quite extraordinary in her courage and her fortitude mm. and her strength. And all over these years, she has worked tirelessly to execute the instructions the Lord gives her and to see to it that his apostolate is taken care of in a most dedicated fashion. And in the midst of that, she raised a family. They're all grown up now at this stage. So those, you know, the obligations of a young family versus an older family, which still exists because a parent's work is never done. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that and I'm not a parent, um, but that a parent's work is never done. But in the midst of all of that, uh, you're, you're talking about an ordinary life lived in an extraordinary fashion, really, when it comes to having to uh, lead an apostolate such as this in the world. So I think it's quite remarkable, really, uh, that she was able to do that. And I think that sometimes there's a, a misconception amongst people that somebody with Anne's gifts 
and experiences, some sort of a pious, almost statuesque type individual. And yet, when you get to know somebody like Anne, and so often people, someone who doesn't know the apostle walks in here and doesn't even realize, well, who's Anne? And, uh, oh, this is Anne. Oh, right. They're, I don't know what they're expecting. <laughs> but it's really what you see is what you get mm. with her, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she has done all that over these years and continues to do it. And I have to say that uh, here in the Apostolate with Anne and with all of us, we were a small team here. We have great fun. And it's so important to have lots of fun. And we do laugh. And we support each other and encourage each other. And fun, yeah, we do have, we have a lot of laughs. God has been very good to us in giving us all to each other in this Apostolate. And it's been many years, right, of knowing each other? Being together in close yes, quarters and yes, r right back since 2000 and I suppose 2003 or so mm. when I would have met Anne first mm -hmm. um, in my original posting as a, a, a high school chaplain in Bailborough. Yes, yeah, so it's many years. We're 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 nearly 20 years at this. Wow! And the apostolate continues to grow mm. and goes grow strongly mm. and grow go to new places and touch new people. And that's been the experience of the, the last almost 20 years, you know. It's been very blessed. Praise God. So yes. we'll continue to, to watch uh, your face change as, as the years go by and, and the different hairstyles that you're, you'll bring to this apostolate. Oh, the early photographs are very different to the ones from today. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to send me some to post. <laughs> no, I won't. The contrast would shock, would shock people too much. <laughs> oh, I prayed before our show, and I and I asked God, and I don't recommend that I do this ever again, or anyone does. You know how you take the Bible or a book, and you say, Lord, show me, and you do that, and then it ends up being the worst thing you could possibly read and totally inappropriate to your situation. <laughs> but I did it anyway. And I, I think okay. I, I got lucky or, or, or graced. You can uh, share it with us? I could share it and you could make a comment and I'll put you on the spot. Sure. Okay. It's not like Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I don't think I'll remain silent. <laughs> That's perfect for radio. So this is May 4th, 2004. Jesus says, Brothers and sisters in the world, Please allow me to fill your heart with heavenly gifts. There is no reason for you to live apart from my kingdom. If you wish it, you can live your life on earth joined to us in heaven. You must practice living in faith, it is true. But like anything else, faith becomes a habit when you practice it. So much so that soon you do not even know you are exerting yourself. That is what I wish for you now, and I am going to assist you by rewarding your tiniest acts of faith with supernatural gifts of faith. In this way, you will only need a small bit to begin your union with heaven. I'm sure as, as with anything that is truly from God, you get persecuted, you have troubles, you have uh, a radio show that doesn't work because you can't get the sound levels right, you have so many things that go wrong all the time because the enemy doesn't want the conversions that you've mentioned. Is there a time where you had a little bit of faith that God made huge because of his grace, just what this message said? I think that is an everyday experience, and every day is very often characterized by a little bit of faith on my part, on the part of us all. And it reminds me of what I would say to people in our contemplative prayer course, for example. We talk about prayer being a gift. Christ mentions faith being a gift in that message. And I think that we sometimes misunderstand that as meaning more so faith is a gift like a box of chocolates that I'm given and I simply gorge on it and I receive and that's it. But rather that faith is so much more like being given the gift of a, let's say, a trumpet. It's like the child who 
prays the prayer, I want a trumpet, I want a trumpet, please give me a trumpet, and they, want, and they get a trumpet, and they never play the trumpet, and they never practice the trumpet, and the trumpet lies gathering dust, and we can pray the prayer, Jesus, give me faith, give me faith, and he will say, yes, I have given you faith. And the good news is that it just means we have to practice faith. Okay, okay, this is good news. Because in our every day, we will be able to utter things like, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe. And that is a very small act of faith, just everyday stuff. And in the face of, yes, indeed, sufferings and persecution and the warfare that can come our way in the pursuit of bringing about God's kingdom in our little corner of the world, those acts of faith are, are vitally important, that we do utter from our own will the words, I believe, because from that God is able to take it and multiply it and make it into something even more profound and beautiful. So I think that's what he's talking about there, is the, the multiplication of the smallest efforts on our part he takes them, multiplies them, and before you know it, we're fast-tracked. But he's the one who's doing the work. It just reminds me of the boy, loaves and fishes. Here. Yes. Here. It's, it's, it's so much in keeping with our one of our daily practices as an apostolate is to say the allegiance prayer. And the allegiance prayer is very much like the morning offering. And it's, dear God in heaven, I pledge my allegiance to you. I give you my life, my work, and my heart. In turn, give me the grace of obeying your every direction to the fullest possible extent. Now, that offering spirituality is vitally important because we are giving him small offerings, an unkind word spoken to us, perhaps. We offer that to heaven. They take it, they multiply it, and it's a source of great gift, grace. Or a kindly smile to a stranger. And we offer that to another human being in the spirit of, of God, and he takes that, he multiplies it, and transforms it and morphs it into hope for that individual who perhaps was really downhearted and despairing. This is the life we live. This is the spirituality of this apostolate. This is what we're about. We're about these small things given in love, given in generosity, with full confidence that Christ's promise to us will be fulfilled in that he'll take care of our interests. He says to us in our lay apostle uh, promise, if we take care of his. So that's the way we live our lives. That's our lay apostle way. So a couple questions. One is, and you've alluded to it, what the church says about these locutions. Well, to go right back to the very beginning, Anne received, had these experiences and has them, continues to. She went to her bishop. She always was very, very clearly focused on the truth and the reality that she will always only ever submit to the authority of the bishop and the church. And so she went to him. He met with her many times. And, and which bishop is this? Uh, this is Bishop Leo O'Reilly okay. in Kilmore Diocese. Mm -hmm. And so she went to Bishop O'Reilly and asked his permission for the printing of the books. And he gave that permission. And he also issued over the years uh, statements to express the fact that this apostolate, this movement, and that Anne was in full obedience to the church and to him as the appropriate authority within the church. So over the years then, uh, Anne cooperated with what we would call a diocesan commission. So in the case of private revelation, it is the local bishop who has the authority and the responsibility to evaluate the situation and to uh, evaluate the uh, writings and the experiences of the individual reporting the private revelation. So of course, the bishop does this over the period of years, and then he deems it worthy to establish a diocesan commission. And a diocesan commission comprised, uh, the diocesan commission comprised two parts. You've got a scientific component and a theological component. And the scientific component is obviously psychiatrists, psychologists evaluating Anne's experiences and her as a, pair, as a person. And the other is then the theological component, where theologians are asked to evaluate Anne's 
experiences and the writings themselves, because in a case of private revelation, the church is looking at, uh, number one, is it in keeping, is the material in keeping with the, uh, the existing revelation of the church? Is it consistent with the teachings of the church? And it is. The other one is, is the means by which the person receives these uh, messages, these experiences, consistent with the mystical tradition of the church, which they are. And the third one is, as they look for fruits, they like to see and they need to see what is this bearing in the life of the people around them. So uh, the bishop established that commission to do that. And uh, he then, over the years following, gave permission for the printing of volumes five and eight. You held up volume uh, five there, Christine, there's volume eight. And those two had in the sequence of 10 uh, been just held back for a time because you know they, they're apocalyptic in nature. They're a particular genre with which the church is completely familiar, but uh, just felt let's just hold off on that um, and let people be immersed in the rest of the writings first. And then, so the bishop granted permission for those to be printed. He also granted a formal imprimatur for the uh, print, for the books. Although he had already given permission, yes, of course, but then he gave it the level of a formal imprimatur. And then, of course, it culminated in 2018 in him granting canonical status to the apostolate. And so it was granted the status of... Um, a lay association of the faithful with juridical personality. So that is the, the status, we would say, of the movement within the church. Now, uh, the determination of the authenticity of the writings, that's in the future, but you know that takes time, and we know that the church thinks more in centuries than it does in years, or even you know decades. It's more thinking in centuries. Uh, that's how it works. So that's uh, where the, the, the church, where Anne and this apostolate has always remained. And it's always very important to, to say that that's the only place Anne could possibly or I could possibly envisage ourselves. Anne has always been very diligent about receiving an instruction from the bishop and following it. And that's really what anybody can ever expect from us in this apostolate is remaining obedient and faithful to the appropriate authority in our lives, which is, in this case, in the Diocese of Kilmore. So it's a private association of the faithful with juridical personality, or one could say also with Father Dara's personality. Is that... Well, with as little of mine as possible, okay. I think that would probably be advisable. But uh, the juridical personality is an interesting thing because it, it does acknowledge that within church law, this apostolate has the same standing as a person would have. You know, it's a, it's a very important aspect of who and what we are. Mm. And it was important to the Lord. But that will give you an idea of the process that that Anne has always, and this apostolate has always submitted to that authority, and uh, any instructions, advice, and guidance that the bishop has ever had to give has been not only received, but desired and wanted. And I think that's important to, to point out, because if there are anything, uh, if there are things that people have written on the internet, or disputes, or problems, those must be put under the level of personal disagreement or misunderstanding or something else besides what the church is saying. I think that's very important because people can take what someone says and place it above the church, and that would be a misinterpretation of what is happening. It would be a grave error, really, for anybody. It would be, it'd be a mistake, at the, at the very least, to do that. Yeah. When uh, there is an appropriate authority, let's at least look to it. Yes, yes. And to close, uh, could you tell the listeners, the viewers, what during this time of lockdowns and COVID and who knows what else may come around the pike, what you are seeking to offer people and what they can do f to help the ministry so that if someone out there is feeling called to, to learn about more, to either receive or to give, what would you say to them? 
we are we are so busy in lockdown and we have been busier than ever in this situation where we are let's say confined to campus we have a call on zoom with apostles of the returning king every two weeks we're doing a volumes in the year reading schedule with people we have mass and adoration daily streamed from here we have prayer group support volume gathering conference every um every month that we're doing at the moment all online we've given people as well uh, available on our facebook page and our youtube channel our our heaven movie our purgatory movie um those are dramatizations of some of the content of Anne's experiences mm. those are quite beautiful we're also using other programs that Anne has developed that are not private revelation um they would be adult faith formation contemplative prayer uh um, courses that she has developed and they're, you know, in her own given name because they're not private revelation and, you know, the bishop and she discussed that and decided, look, if it's not private revelation, keep it separate and keep it in your own name. But we use them here to most wonderful effect mm-hmm. and people are benefit from them. So we have been busy, busy, busy. And if anybody wants to get involved and know more about us, please do send us a message through our website and uh, let us know uh, anything you'd like to find out from us. You can start joining our monthly calls, sign up for our emails, uh, our bi-weekly calls, that is, and uh, just come and see. And you'll find our YouTube channel. You'll find us on Facebook, Direction for Our Times on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're doing all these things. So it's quite busy and extremely happy. Could you name the website again for people? directionforourtimes.org or dot .com or dot .com works as well. Yeah, dot .org, directionforourtimes.org or dot .com. And you'll find there our streaming page and all the ways that you can contact us. And obviously our, our shopping cart is there for books and everything else. And our YouTube channel, you'll find us on YouTube if you look up Direction for Our Times and you'll see the other videos and content we have there as well. Wonderful. And is there something you'd like from from people? I'm sure it's overwhelming, all that you do. What kind of support do you need? Well, we're a nonprofit, so I mean, I'm often the one charged with saying uh, to, to people, hey, listen, if you've got anything spare at the end of the week, if it's a dollar, it's five dollars, sure, just throw it our way. We'll always w- receive it uh, warmly to support the work because as a nonprofit, the, the, the title gives it all away. <laughs> it's non-profit and uh, you know you de- we depend on God's providence and he gives and he is generous but we pursue God's providence and so by all means if anybody would like to support our work financially or they would like to begin distributing booklets at the back of a church or taking part in a prayer group these are ways in which not just that this work can be supported but this work can support people wherever they are and whatever they're doing so yeah, that that would be that would be great. Father Dara, it's gone much too quick, and I thank you so much for your beautiful heart, your beautiful presence, your 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 words, which have explained the apostolate better than I've heard ever. I mean, not as not as well as as I could explain it, but anyway, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'll interview you next. No. <laughs> So would you do the honors of saying a prayer for those who have tuned in? And truly, this is a worldwide apostolate. This is causing conversions in in countries around the world. And I'm sure you've heard so many testimonies, but there's so many testimonies you haven't heard. You haven't heard how, yes. how it affected somebody like me, because I don't think after I'm moved by a volume to write to you. So you know, be assured that this has been uh, an explosion of grace and mercy. And thank you for being a part of it. It's been, it's wonderful to be a part of it. It's such a blessing. And we're so glad to bring those blessings to others. And, and uh, so we, we, we'll, we'll pray then in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we place before you all the prayers, all of the needs, all of the intentions of the viewers and listeners who are participating with us right now. We ask you, Lord, to look so generously on all their deepest needs and desires, 
Their pains, their sufferings, we place before you, and we ask your healing graces upon them. We place all these needs before our Blessed Mother Mary. We ask our Blessed Mother to look generously upon them, to place her hand upon anybody who's suffering grievously, anybody suffering any particularly severe anguish or suffering. We ask you, Blessed Mother, place your hand upon them and obtain for them the grace only you can you can give. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now, and ever shall be, world without Amen. end. Amen. Amen. And for all you listeners and viewers, may you find your way home. God bless you. <laughs>